audience around the world to the third lecture of the series on the American state in a multipolar world, sponsored by the Center for the Study of Economy and Society at Cornell University. My name is Victor Nee, director of the center. I am honored and enthralled to, by the occasion to introduce Jeffrey Sachs, university professor and director of the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University. In an age of specialization, it is rare to find an economist whose professional interests and publications span a global canvas, addressing the central dilemmas and challenges of the 21st century's world economy and society. The Economist magazine lists Professor Sachs as one of the three most influential living economists, and for good reason. Jeffrey Sachs is not an armchair intellectual. He is an action-oriented economist who has served as the director of the Earth Institute at Columbia University from 2002 to 2016. He has been advisors to three secretaries general at the United Nations, countless heads of state, and is the president of the UN Sustainable Development Solution Network. Professor Sachs played a seminal role in serving as advisor to post-Soviet governments across Eastern and Central Europe in the transition to market economies. His many publications from this period reflect the intractable dilemmas of rapid transition from state socialism and central planning, as well as the lost opportunity of the United States to build a constructive relationship with post-Soviet Russia. Years before this lecture series, Sachs framed the core problems and challenges of sustainable development in a multipolar world. His numerous books and articles have defined and addressed the new era of cross-cutting global networks of trade and super rapid information flow. A development economist, Sachs has argued that the 21st century is the age of sustainable development in which economic, social, and environmental changes are interconnected. His books detail why in the age of sustainability Interdependence means that local and global politics are inseparable. It is my great pleasure to turn to Jeffrey Sachs, who speaks to us live from Columbia University. Jeff? Victor, thank you so much. Thank you for that lovely introduction and uh, greetings to everybody uh, this evening. I'm delighted to be with you. We are getting uh, perhaps almost an overdose of uh, multipolarity and multilateralism in recent days uh, because of the COP26 uh, climate conference uh, that uh, just uh, finished uh, because of the summit, which I uh, am very much hoping can uh, align with the, the remarks I'm about to make on avoiding a Cold War uh, between the US uh, and China. Uh, we had the G20 in Rome at the end of October, uh, and of course, uh, the UN General Assembly meetings, as always, at the end of September and the beginning of October. It's been a lot of diplomacy uh, over recent weeks, uh, some positive, some showing uh, the serious limitations of our multilateralism, of the efficacy of our international institutions. Uh, we certainly have not yet solved the climate crisis. Uh, we haven't even gotten uh, the world on uh, a new trajectory uh, definitively yet. Uh, so all of what we're living day by day 
not to mention a pandemic that has, of course, hit the whole world and disrupted the whole world, I think and I hope reminds us of our extreme interdependence in the world uh, and our extreme vulnerabilities uh, in the world, uh, whether it is pandemics uh, or climate uh, or other environmental hazards uh, or political instability in so many places, the uh, very tough confrontational uh, talk. I, I was uh, thinking of uh, whether there was a stronger word between the U.S. and China in recent months, uh, almost the flippancy uh, in our media of saying, will we have a war with uh, China over Taiwan, for example? Uh, all of this, uh, first of all, frames my remarks, uh, but it also uh, really underpins my main point, which is that we must avoid conflict uh, and must recognize how strong our potential gains from cooperation are and how the uh, logic of our uh, so-called uh, uh, confrontation with China now or competition with China is really not logic at all. It's a very dangerous misunderstanding, in my view, of the real situation that our countries face. And so that's the uh, main uh, theme that I would like to uh, emphasize this evening. And I, I want to show you uh, some of the reasons for this, but I'll start uh, with a, a classroom uh, classic uh, of, of the prisoner's dilemma, because after all, so much of the nature of uh, the way international relations is understood uh, and interpreted uh, really does fit this canonical uh, notion of the prisoner's dilemma, in my view. We have uh, this dyadic relationship, this uh, two-country relationship of the two most powerful countries in the world, the United States and China. And in each uh, country, uh, there is, uh, let's say, a hardline option uh, pushed by hardliners, and there is a, a, a de-escalation option. And the prisoner's dilemma explains how the uh, rational decision making on both sides, uh, if done in a uh, in independent, non-negotiated matter manner between the two sides, can leave us uh, in a quite miserable situation. So the story uh, put in the context of. Uh, this two country competition uh, is that it is better for both China and the US to live in a world of mutual de-escalation. Uh, we don't have then the danger of war. We don't have the extraordinary expenses of an arms race. Uh, and so uh, as we see in uh, the two by two matrix of this game, uh, the upper left-hand corner has a return notionally of, say, five uh, for each country. Maybe it's $5 trillion benefit of being uh, in a world of mutual de-escalation. A world of mutual escalation uh, is marked by the lower right-hand corner, and we'll put that uh, uh, as zero return for each country. Of course, the problem comes if one country de-escalates, the other then can make a tactical victory by escalating, uh, perhaps uh, then imposing uh, predominant power vis-a-vis -vis the other country. And so if China were to de-escalate and the U.S. escalate, uh, what's uh, shown in the uh, lower left-hand corner of this two-by-two -two matrix is that the United States would uh, get a return of 10 rather than 5 of mutual de-escalation, and China would suffer an absolute loss by uh, virtue of its uh, uh, inferior power status of 
minus five. And similarly, if the U.S. were to de-escalate, but China continued, for example, to arm and escalate, the United States might lose its influence in Asia as a result, and that would mean a loss of five for the United States and a gain of 10 for China. Well, this is a very familiar game, uh, and put this way, uh, the problem is well known, that if China chooses to de-escalate, the United States uh, has the best uh, advantage in escalating. If China chooses to escalate, it certainly uh, behooves the United States to escalate. It turns out that escalation is America's dominant strategy, no matter what China does. And since the situation is symmetrical, uh, China would see that its best strategy is to escalate, no matter whether the U.S. de-escalates or escalates. And as we know now for the last 70 years of thinking about this prisoner's dilemma, both countries end up in the lower right-hand quadrant with no gains at all, and therefore have lost the benefits of avoiding an arms race. Each one says, no matter what the other country does, it's better for me to be tough. And so both are tough, and the loss is experienced by both who spend a tremendous amount of time and perhaps uh, actually engage in open conflict with the other. So as is well known, the equilibrium, the so-called Nash equilibrium, <laughs> is the lower right-hand corner. And realists in international affairs will tell you, well, I believe in peace through strength. This is the only thing we can do. We must be tough. We must be strong. Uh, this is the only way. And China is going to be that way as well. So we certainly uh, should uh, not uh, uh, in, in any way think about uh, de-escalating uh, from our current situation. Clearly, there is a mutual gain waiting to be enjoyed if both sides uh, would uh, be able to make a move from a hardline position to uh, a more dovish position, if you call it that, or a position of de-escalation. And the prisoner's dilemma is a dilemma because we end up uh, in the uh, non-cooperative lower right-hand quadrant and give up the gains from cooperation. Now, as uh, I think many know, uh, listening uh, uh, this evening, uh, this kind of two-person interaction has been studied in literally thousands and thousands of experiments uh, of all sorts in all parts of the world. And the interesting point is that the actual participants in games like The Prisoner's Dilemma generally are able to find their way to the cooperative outcome. While the theory says that there should be non-cooperation, the puzzle for economists, which after all is a quite strange breed perhaps, uh, is that in practice, there is a tremendous amount of cooperation. And one way, not surprisingly, to get that cooperation is if you have two people play a prisoner's dilemma and they're able to talk with each other before they decide on their moves. So communication, even what's called cheap talk because it's not binding communication, enables both players to realize and to mutually commit, and then to honor their commitment to move to de-escalation. Well, there are endless theories written about this, uh, that uh, we are evolutionarily primed to be able to cooperate, uh, that uh, cooperative behavior was selected for various reasons. Uh, uh, Darwin in uh, The Descent of Man, written uh, 150 years ago, in fact, this year in 1871, 
speculated on the reasons uh, why human beings inherited at least the potential for cooperation. It's interesting for me also that John Nash, who developed uh, this game theoretic framework, uh, was not very communicative. Some people say he was on the Asperger spectrum. Uh, certainly there was a sense that a game was not a game of communication. A game was taking as given what the other country or the other partner or the other opponent is doing and then choosing one's best strategy, taking as given the strategy of the other. But because human cooperation and I should say human communication allows us to mutually understand the advantages of cooperation. And of course, because we are generally in an environment of repeated or so-called iterated plays where we honor our commitments because we want to be able to continue to cooperate in the future, the potential for ongoing cooperation is much greater than the naive prisoner's dilemma framework allows. Now, my view is that our strategists in the United States, and no doubt strategists uh, in China, are too much wedded to the non-communication prisoner's dilemma framework. They take as given, or they assume the worst of the counterparts, and then make decisions or choose strategies based on perhaps the worst assumptions of what the other side is going to do. I think that this is an extraordinarily dangerous and misguided approach to foreign policy because it's actually possible to talk with the counterpart, not just talk, to talk endlessly, relentlessly, daily with the counterpart. And so the fact that I'm speaking just an hour before President Biden, President Xi actually get online for a conversation uh, is probably a, 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 a good moment for my remarks, but it really wouldn't hurt the leaders of the two most powerful countries of the world to chat a little bit more than once a year, perhaps. Uh, it's not so hard to Zoom these days. Uh, and I think that this kind of open communication would certainly clarify tremendously many of the perceived uh, challenges that each country faces. I think in general, in my experience, speaking with senior policymakers and watching their behavior, American policymakers do not assume that they're could be uh, cooperative outcomes. They rather assume wrongly, in my view, that Chinese actions are both fixed and hostile. Uh, it was interesting that in the lead up to COP26, uh, just a few weeks ago, there was obviously a big debate in the White House between John Kerry, our climate envoy, who is a dove in these matters and obviously believes in the potential for cooperation and the more hardliners in the State Department and in the National Security Council. And I thought that one quote uh, of one of the senior officials who went unnamed in the story uh, was especially pertinent. Uh, this was uh, denying the potential gains from cooperation by saying they, that is the Chinese, are going to make their decisions based on their national interest. This is a perfectly nonsensical statement, by the way, because as the prisoner's dilemma model shows, the national interest actually depends on the ability to cooperate with the other, and it should not be taken as given what the national interest is. It depends on the relations between the two countries. But if you say they're going to do what they're going to do no matter what we do, you end up in the lower right-hand quadrant of this game with escalation on both sides. 
So this is more or less how our national security doctrines have evolved in recent years. Uh, each of our official documents, certainly during the Trump period, but continuing into the Biden administration, uh, take the view that China and Russia are out to shape a world, as it says in 2017, antithetical to U.S. values and interests, that China seeks to displace the United States in the Indo-Pacific region, and so forth. But the idea of the American policy, at least as it's stated in print, is this extraordinary idea that China and Russia are out to shape a world not just perhaps different from uh, U.S. Uh, values and interests, but antithetical to U.S. values and interests. Uh, and this, I think, is the mindset of our security establishment. Similarly, in 2018, it is increasingly clear that China and Russia want to shape a world consistent with their authoritarian model, gaining veto authority over other nations' economic, diplomatic, and security decisions. Well, why is this uh, point of view so prevalent these days in Washington? Clearly, it, well, I, I should say not clearly, in my opinion, uh, it all relates uh, to a kind of neurotic uh, view of China because of China's economic recovery during the past 40 years. There has been a significant rebalancing of the world economy. China is not the impoverished country that it was in 1980. Uh, it has become a large, modern, innovative, dynamic economy. And this, I think, is the real source of American policymakers' concerns, not China's ambitions, but simply China's size and success, which is a quite different matter mm -hmm. after all. So this is a graph showing <laughs> the last 200 years estimates, of course, of the share of different regions in the total world economy. The world economy means the sum of the national gross domestic products to create a notion of a world product, and then looking at the share of each part of the world in that. Well, back in 1820, the line at the top that you see, if you can see uh, this clearly, a blue line was at 0.6 or 60% of the world economy. That is the share of Asia in the world economy back in 1820. It may seem surprising that Asia had 60% of the world economy, but remember Asia had 60% of the world's population. Everybody was poor, and so the world economy shares by region were roughly uh, the shares of population of each region. But if you can see, follow that line throughout uh, the course of the next two centuries, Asia's share of the world economy diminishes sharply to reach the lowest point in 1950. What does this reflect? This reflects, of course, Britain's the British Empire's colonization of India and the Western uh, increase in control over China, followed by the disarray of China in the uh, first half of the 20th century, warlordism, civil war, and Japan's invasion of China. China had a terrible 130 years from 18, 1820 to 1950. Uh, and China fell precipitously into profound poverty from having been a sophisticated society, albeit an agrarian society. China went into disarray, uh, massive domestic violence and deaths, uh, repeated invasions from the outside world, and therefore, essentially, the uh, lost opportunity of industrialization before 1950.
1950. If you trace that blue line from 1950 to today, you see, like a giant U, Asia's share turns upward. And in fact, China, of course, since 1980 in particular, achieved more than a 30-time increase of GDP because it doubled essentially every seven or eight years in total economic size. Now, the black line at the top uh, of the middle of the diagram, which starts at about 30% and then peaks at about 70%, is what I call the North Atlantic region. It's the US, Canada, and Europe. And we became a North Atlantic world in the 19th century with the rise of the European empires. And then in the 20th century with the American surge to uh, become the largest economy by far in the world, especially after uh, Europe's uh, two uh, devastating wars, the world economy became a North Atlantic economy. The industrial age was a North Atlantic age. And it meant that not only were the North Atlantic economies, the industrial economies, but the European imperialism uh, and US imperialism dominated the world, uh, at least until the end of World War II. After World War II, Europe, of course, lost its empires uh, in, at, uh, uh, over a, a period of 30 or 40 years. Uh, and the newly independent countries, and notably the People's Republic of China, and also India, and other countries of Asia, the notable rapid growth recovery of Japan, the growth of uh, Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong, and so forth, uh, meant that the North Atlantic share of the world economy consequently diminished as Asia recovered a normal place in the world economy. Not a superlative place, not overtaking the per capita income of the North Atlantic, but beginning to narrow a large gap in per capita income that had opened up during the 130 years from 1820 to 1950. Well, roughly around 2020, you could say that the total Western world, if you add in the European Union, the United States, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, was overtaken by, the East, A by East Asia alone, China, Japan, Korea and ASEAN countries. This is rather extraordinary that uh, the East Asian world now is a larger economy than the, not only the North Atlantic world, but the North Atlantic plus Oceania. And if we look at China and the US alone, using purchasing power parity defined world, uh, national economies, that is, defining the U.S. and uh, Chinese economy at world prices, China overtook the United States in absolute size roughly around uh, 2014, and now is a considerably larger economy in absolute scale. It's important to remember, please, that China is four times more populous than the United States, 1.4 billion people compared to 330 million in the United States. So even though China is in absolute scale, a larger economy, China continues to be only about one third of the per capita income level of the United States measured at international prices and measured at market prices even less than that, roughly about a fifth of the US GDP. So China is still a developing country, considerably poorer per capita than the United States and Europe, but being a country of 1.4 billion people, it is a very large economy, indeed the single largest economy in the world, measured at international prices, and number two, measured at uh, market prices and market exchange rates. 
I should add that China has become a very innovative economy as well, starting roughly at the beginning of the 21st century, <coughs> China began to invest heavily in science and technology, uh, graduating hundreds of thousands of PhDs each year. And the results are very exciting. Uh, and I put that in a positive note. China has become a highly innovative economy with many cutting edge technologies. This scares the wits out of the United States but I rather think this is a benefit for the world because China's innovations will play a significant role or should and can play a significant role in human well-being. I worked for many years in Africa <clears throat> and have watched China's uh, anti-malarial medicine, artemisinin, save the lives of vast numbers in Africa, millions and millions of lives. That's an example of, in that case, a Nobel Prize winning innovation from China with huge global benefits. Another huge benefit is that China developed very low cost uh, production systems for photovoltaics, for wind turbines, for large distance uh, power transmission, and for 5G. So many countries are the beneficiaries of these technological advances. Of course, unfortunately in Washington, it's not seen that way. Uh, it's seen as absolutely terrifying that what is supposed to be the American led world, the American century, American dominance and American primacy is threatened by this interloper. And it's viewed as illegitimate, but most importantly as dangerous. I should say right at the beginning, I'm not very concerned about China uh, replacing the U.S. as a hegemonic or dominant power of the world. Uh, I don't think there will be one. Uh, and one reason for that is what I'm showing you here. These are the proportions of different regions in global population, not in a global income. And the uh, line that is upward sloping is Africa's rapid population growth. Uh, Africa now has about 1.4 billion people, including Sub-Saharan and Northern Africa, so about the same size as India and China. But it's on a path to double uh, in the next uh, 20 or 25 years. And it is on a path to uh, basically triple to reach uh, more than 4 billion people by the end of the century if current uh, fertility uh, patterns were to <coughs> continue as projected. <coughs> but China, mind you, is on a path, that's the uh, uh, East Asia line, uh, the blue line. China's on a path of a rapid decline of population not only the one child policy, but the continuation of low fertility rates, even after the lifting of the one child policy. And it's estimated that China's population, which is today 1.4 billion, will be about 1 billion by the end of the 21st century. And the age will be quite old. Uh, China probably will have a median age of perhaps 55 or 57 years. My view is that these will be tremendous social challenges. China has a, a tremendous uh, amount of catching up to do still, uh, massive uh, social challenges of an aging and declining population. And none of it adds up to me as uh, remotely uh, being uh, hegemonic uh, in prospect. But I should say that uh, the American mindset of our policymakers is quite different. Uh, and uh, one notable study, which frankly terrified me when I first read it six years ago by a former colleague of mine at, uh, at the Kennedy School at Harvard, Robert Blackwell, uh, said that China's growth is a danger because America seeks preeminent power over its rivals, that we demand systemic primacy. In other words, the world really is a zero-sum game. 
there is no room for China to succeed. And it seems to me that the lesson is uh, uh, if China is to be smaller than the United States, it has to be much poorer than the U.S. because it's a bigger population. But that seems to be the logic of the uh, Washington establishment. And Black will reach the conclusion that uh, it's Washington needs a new grand strategy towards China uh, that uh, centers on balancing the rise of Chinese power rather than continuing to assist in its ascendancy. So all of this is to say that China's rise, though still far behind the United States and Europe in per capita terms, because of China's absolute size and because of China's growing technological preeminence, is viewed as a threat to the United States, mainly in my view, because the United States has a zero-sum view of the world, uh, or American policymakers and strategists do, that the United States must remain on top. The notion of Cornell's seminar series that we have a multipolar world is not accepted. We have uh, must have a world, according to U.S. strategy, in which the U.S. is the dominant power. And the U.S. is in the business right now of trying to maintain its preeminence in dangerous ways. Uh, one way is this recent announcement by uh, the Secretary General of NATO that NATO will expand its focus to counter China's rise. I find this wrongheaded in every way. NATO, in my mind, is in any event an anachronism. It, it was a military alliance to counter a country that no longer exists, the Soviet Union. But it is looking for a new mission, and apparently the United States views NATO's new mission as a kind of expeditionary force to protect American primacy in the world, which, in my opinion, is not of uh, fundamental interest for Europe, and I would say not a fundamental interest for the United States, but rather the kind of logic that will get us to the lower right-hand quadrant of the prisoner's dilemma. <clears throat> it's worth asking which of our countries is actually the more belligerent, the less trustworthy, uh, the more unilateral. And I would argue that the United States is far more unilateral and uh, than China. So our attribution to China of ill motives vis-a-vis -vis the United States is more perhaps psychological projection than it is reality. I'll give you a few examples. The United States simply stopped ratifying UN treaties actually decades ago. It's almost a truism in the United States Senate that if the world wants it, the U.S. should not accept it. Because after all, the U.S. needs to be the, have the primacy, not simply the cooperation with the rest of the world. <clears throat> so most of the U.N. treaties of recent decades remain unsigned by the United States, while China has signed almost all of these treaties, or perhaps all of these treaties on this particular page. I should uh, be more clear about that in this slide. But the United States has not. Of course, the United States has been engaged in rampant, and I would say reckless, destructive, and failed military and CIA interventions all over the world for the last 70 six years since 1945, whereas China <clears throat> has been engaged since 1980 in not one overseas war at all. So since 1980, which was uh, the end of China's temporary incursion into Vietnam, China has not been engaged in one overseas conflict, whereas the United States went to war in Central America, it went to war in the Middle East, it went to war in Africa, it went to war uh, in uh, the Arabian Peninsula, uh, it went to war in Syria, Libya, uh, countless 
uh, wars, trillions of dollars spent, 800 overseas military bases, and we're the ones that say that China is the hostile power. So simply step, stepping back and asking, is it really true that China is implacably opposed to cooperation with the United States? I see no evidence whatsoever of that. If one looks at it from the Chinese perspective and asks, is it possible to cooperate with the United States, one would be given some pause to be sure, given the extreme unilateralism of US foreign policy over the last 40 years, rejecting UN treaties, walking out of UN organizations, uh, and engaging in military and covert conflicts, not so covert, but ostensibly covert operations, uh, contrary to the UN charter. And of course, the US military presence is throughout the world, whereas China has one overseas small military base, a naval station in Djibouti uh, in uh, the Horn of Africa, uh, whereas the US dots the world. So we make all sorts of claims about China's aggression in the South China Sea, but China it has a different view, which is that the United States surrounds China in the South China Sea, and China's actions, in my view, are mostly defensive actions to protect its sea lanes, which are essential for China's uh, lifeline, uh, in fact, against the potential strangulation by a hostile United States. And the U.S. also is the country that engages in nonstop unilateral sanctions against other countries, again, in violation of the U.N. Charter. And so my point of all of this is not simply railing against the U.S., but to express my extreme displeasure and doubt at claims made in the United States that China is somehow implacably opposed to US interests and unwilling to cooperate. I personally see no evidence about it at all. Let me uh, conclude by uh, talking about uh, four different alternative visions of our current global scene. When I was a graduate student, uh, a long time ago, uh, in the 1970s, we were reading this wonderful book by the uh, economic historian Charles Kindleberger, who wrote a history of the Great Depression, where he argued that the Great Depression was as deep as it was because there was no hegemonic power in the 1930s to overcome the Great Depression. Britain was no longer the global hegemon because of World War I. The United States was not yet ready to accept the global responsibility as it would after World War II. So Kindleberger bemoaned the fact that there was no dominant global power and therefore crises would deepen. This is certainly one interpretation of our current world scene. China is not the hegemon, but the United States no longer is the hegemonic power in Kindleberger's terms. And perhaps the world is adrift in part because there is no dominant force in the world. One view. A second view, of course, famous uh, with Henry Kissinger, is that we do live in a multipolar world and we should find stability in the balance of power. And Kissinger's notion of this, of course, is the Metternich Bismarckian world of Europe in the 19th century, the uh, century of relative peace, although there were a lot of wars actually, between the end of the Napoleonic Wars and the outbreak of World War I. And Kissinger believed that one could maintain 
a balance of power. Realism would say everybody arms, but that doesn't mean war because a balance of power prevents aggressive action by any one of the protagonists. I'm very skeptical of this theory because I don't believe that balance, uh, that we live in a static world and with change as rapid as it is and with chance of miscalculation as large as it is, I don't believe in balance of power as the source of non-conflict. I'm more <clears throat> uh, pessimistic about uh, a balance of power because I believe that grave accidents or misunderstandings uh, can cause a disaster uh, like World War I or the near end of the world at the Cuban Missile Crisis. And so the balance of power theory leaves me extremely worried. A third interpretation of our current scene is by Graham Allison, uh, of course, at the Kennedy School of Government, who uh, analogizes China's rise with the rise of Athens uh, after the uh, Persian Wars, and therefore the competition between Sparta and Athens that eventually led in 431 BC to the outbreak of the Peloponnesian Wars. And so since Thucydides was the chronicler of the Peloponnesian Wars, Allison has called this Thuc the Thucydides trap. Are we destined for war, he asks, because the rising power of China will provoke a conflict with the United States? Well, this is also a possibility, but I would argue certainly not a destiny. So my modest contribution to, to this list uh, is to suggest uh, that what we need is global cooperation theory. We have to understand in our highly interdependent world with common vulnerabilities, massive common vulnerabilities, not only to arms races and nuclear conflict, but to climate change, destruction of biodiversity, pandemics, and uh, the like, uh, and global financial crises and the like, that we should be aiming for global cooperation to move us from the lower right-hand quadrant to the upper left-hand quadrant of cooperation. A lot of my work tries to emphasize and in a way quantify or even qualify, I should say, uh, the nature of this cooperation, which I think is pervasive. But one essential overriding reason for the need for this cooperation is what President John F. Kennedy said in his inaugural address when he said the world is very different now, for man holds in his mortal hands the power to abolish all forms of human poverty and all forms of human life, referring to the risk of thermonuclear war. We can't have a Bismarckian balance of power, which ended up failing because of accidents of history. We can't afford accidents. We can't have a Thucydides trap war between the U.S. and China. It's unthinkable, or if you're going to do any thinking, do it ahead of time because no one will be left after the war. In the nuclear age, period, we need a new kind of foreign policy. But more than that, uh, in a world of all of the common threats that we face, this is even more the case. President Kennedy couldn't know that we could destroy all forms of human life also through environmental devastation. And so the need to focus on the cooperative side is paramount in our time. I like to emphasize, and I'll close uh, quickly with this, that we need a global doctrine of subsidiarity. This is the idea that we face collective challenges at all scales in our families, in our neighborhoods, in our cities, in our states, in our nations, in our regions, and globally. And subsidiarity says solve the collective action problems at the lowest level possible. Schools can be run locally, but 
climate change needs to be solved globally and other global crises need to be solved at the global scale. And once we recognize the crucial role of cooperation, then I think we can break free of various naive ideas, either a naive nationalism or even a naive globalism. We need to solve problems at different levels by virtue of the nature of the problems that we are confronting. In terms of critical areas for global cooperation, ending poverty, protecting the environment from human assault, resisting spiraling inequality, managing large-scale demographic change such as mass urbanization and aging, and of course maintaining peace are all paramount areas for global cooperation. These sustainable development goals are areas needing global cooperation for their achievement and avoiding a new divided world. So I'll just end by saying, I believe that our paramount foreign policy challenge is strengthening multilateralism, making the UN system more effective than it is, and that requires many measures and many steps, but it especially requires the cooperation of the leading powers and the recognition of global shared values. And I will stop there and turn it back over to you, Victor. Thank you very much for this extremely uh, incisive and uh, clear argument uh, against uh, a new Cold War <laughs> uh, and for global cooperation. Uh, we have time for a few questions. Uh, this uh, series, this lecture ends at 6 p.m. and we have now about seven minutes. Uh, the first question poses this quest, the problem. There has been a significant centralization of power in China under Xi Jinping. At the same time, we, see, see, we are seeing polarization in the United States and a lack of unity among Western nations. How do these trends affect foreign policy calculations on both sides? Ah. That's a really superb question. Uh, I think that uh, these trends are, uh, first of all, not inevitable, uh, and uh, in part are, let's say, endogenous to global dynamics. Uh, part of the uh, more centralization of power in China is the determination uh, not to let the United States or the West or NATO undermine Chinese unity, which I think is uh, probably the paramount uh, interest of Chinese statecraft. So when the United States uh, puts the emphasis in our bilateral uh, relations of China, on issues uh, like Hong Kong or Taiwan or Xinjiang, the response in China is an extraordinarily defensive response, saying those are attempts by the West to divide us. And in, in uh, Taiwan, this really has become very dangerous, uh, almost a flashpoint in the last year or two, even leading uh, President Biden to, I don't know whether it was improvise, state accurately, but he invented a new doctrine a couple of weeks ago saying that uh, the United States would defend China, uh, defend Taiwan against uh, uh, Chinese aggression, which the United States had never said before. Uh, this is a complicated topic, but just to say that the nature of Chinese domestic politics uh, is affected by the geopolitical environment. 
the divisions in the United States are a, a different matter. They're not caused by the outside world in the same way, uh, though they may lead us to take foreign policy actions uh, in, in response to domestic politics. The divisions in the United States are, uh, well, it's a long, complicated subject, but I believe that it uh, relates to mainly the underlying changes of the U.S. economy to a more education-based and skill-based and service-based economy over the last 50 years that is leading to a tremendous widening of income inequality in the United States and that has not been addressed through proper public policies. So we are coming apart at the seams, I believe, geographically, culturally, but perhaps most importantly, across an educational gradient in the U.S. And it's quite dangerous for us, not so much of what China might do to take advantage. I'm not worried about that, but just our own internal divisions are so serious now that uh, we are not functioning properly as a country internally, irrespective of the international scene. And it is not an accident that the U.S., uh, has uh, suffered uh, now more than 760,000 deaths from COVID. Uh, these were overwhelmingly unnecessary deaths, but to my mind, a sign of the disarray of U.S. society, not caused at all by the international scene, uh, other than a virus that, that passes international boundaries, but caused by our own internal divisions, which are consequently extremely serious in their implication for us. Thank you. We have time, I think, for one more question. And that question is, the demonization of China creates a lose-lose policy. How can we prevent policymakers from pursuing this strategy? I think the demonization is the right word for what we read in our, even our mainstream media, uh, much less uh, other, uh, much less reputable outlets as well. (laughs) It has become a commonplace in the U.S. media (coughs) that China is an enemy, Uh, just as it is commonplace in our diplomatic documents that China has is designing, trying to design a world that is antithetical to U.S. interests. Of course, from a substantive point of view, the right way to think about these issues, in my view, is to try to see the world from the perspective of the other party. That's what I tried to do briefly in my remarks, to understand China's perspective from a perspective of China's history, Uh, China's perspective from the perspective of viewing U.S. behavior and so forth, in which case, in my view, uh, China is far less of a threat and far more of an opportunity for cooperation. And therefore, uh, demonization is dangerous and wrongheaded. So how do we uh, change this in the U.S.? I I think universities have a big role to play. It is our job to think as clearly as possible, Uh, but also we have, many of us have uh, ongoing, uh, longstanding uh, work uh, programs uh, with Chinese scholars, uh, with Chinese universities and so forth. We create many of the sinews of cooperation. Uh, I am repeatedly in touch with my former students or my colleagues on joint research projects and so forth. Uh, And of course, uh, I've traveled to China pre-COVID typically two or three times a year for nearly 40 years. Uh, And so it is the human connections that I think are extremely important, but also raising our voices to not slip into uh, a mindless mindset. Uh, And uh, that, I think, is our our big danger. Uh, We should not be complacent uh, or even 
viewing this as maybe silly, the situation has become dangerous, uh, not because of China's aggression, but because of a mindset. Uh, and this, I think, creates the risks of self-fulfilling crisis. I don't want Taiwan to be a flashpoint. <clears throat> I want to emphasize that we support the one China policy. I don't want to hear the president of the United States talk about war in Taiwan and what the United States would do. All of this strikes me as completely wrongheaded and provocative. And especially understanding China's interest not to be dismembered as it was in the 19th and 20th centuries and to, to uh, understand China's historical perspective on these issues, I think is uh, can take us quite far towards a far more productive relationship. Well, thank you very much. And this is, uh, we've run out of time. Uh, and certainly the last point is well taken. Uh, the Republic of China has in its constitution that it is uh, the uh, uh, province of China and the People's Republic of China has it in its constitution that Taiwan is a province of China. And the United States in recognizing China agreed to a one China policy. And that is also the position of the United Nations. So formally speaking, there should be basic agreement <laughs> on the issue that could lead to the outbreak of war. Uh, anyway, thank you so much. Uh, and we are very grateful to your taking the time to speak to this audience. It's, it's been a privilege and an honor and great to be with you, Victor. Thank you so much. Take care, Jeff. Bye-bye.